Tonse, welcome to Métis Minute, your source for Métis news in Region 7. Welcome back to Métis Minute. I am your host, Samantha Loney. And today we wanted to bring you some more stories from the municipality of Penetanguishene. Today, we wanted to cover a special city council meeting that is happening in the city of Penetanguishene. For some of you civic buffs out there, you might know that a lot of city councils are adjourned at this time of year, but the city of Penetanguishene had to address some issues from staff. This public meeting was to address a staff report on building permit increases. So city council got together to discuss whether there would be a bylaw amendment or an annual fixed increase for building permits. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, council. The reason for tonight's public meeting is for the town to meet its le legislative requirement under the Building Code Act when increasing the building permit fees. As council may recall, the building permit fees were reviewed by Watson and Associates in June 2023. The result in council pass this resulted in a council passing a motion to support the proposed new fee structure and future increases would be indexed at the annual tax rate. In order for the fees to be indexed annually, it must be in the building bylaw. However, the wording was not included, and as a result, the Ontario Building Code Act requires a public meeting to occur prior to an increase occurring. Staff are requesting that the existing bylaw be amended to include the council approved annual indexing based on the tax rate. Once this additional wording is included in the bylaw, the annual increase would occur without the need for a public meeting. Thank you, Chair. That concludes my summary of the item before council. Thank you very much. So just in summary, this makes it quite simple. Everyone has a predictability to what the building uh, fees are going to be as they increase yearly. So there's some predictability to that. We like to do that in all of our policy making, make life as simple as possible and have as few obstructions as possible to new development or renovations and other things that require permits. So with that, I'd like to open the meeting to comments or uh, input from the public. If there's anyone here to provide that, please uh, step up to the mic. I give your name um, and your, your well, I think your name and address. It's just good to know if you're a Midland resident and uh, let us hear what you have to say. Is there anyone in the room that would like to make comment about this? Again, anyone in the room want to make comment? All right, well, that was easy. I can just add that uh, typically, uh, at least in the past, when the municipality has made uh, changes, whether they're progressive or also deemed regressive to some of our policies, especially around planning, um, I'm typically inundated with emails and phone calls and requests for a lunch, uh, you know, to lament whatever change we're about to do and how it's going to impact negatively our development partners. And I'm proud to say that uh, all of that kind of ended after about the first six months of this term as we really started to do housekeeping and be really responsive uh, to our development community and the people that are trying to build and better their property. And in this particular case, I've had zero, <laughs> zero emails, phone calls. No one's invited me to lunch to cry in the beer about what changes are about to make. So when I, I don't get those kind of um, those calls, that's usually a sign that we're on the right track and that the report that the, you know, developers and whatnot read clearly articulates the rationale for these, for this and that it, it it seems measured and reasonable to them. So good work, good report, and uh, this just makes sense. And uh, I open it up now to council. Um, I have to say this though, um, when there are no further comments, oh, that's, sorry, that's just prompting for me. Uh, <laughs> insert name here. Sorry, I've only had one coffee. Um, I need to read this motion and then I can open it up for, for a discussion with the, uh, with my peers here on council. So moved by Deputy Mayor Pro, seconded by Councillor McDonald, that staff report CSR 2024-67, building permit fee increase dated July 10th, 2024, be received, and that one, council adopts the building permit fee bylaw as attached to this report, 
and two, that the building permit fee bylaw be indexed annually by the annual budget increase, which we're going to keep as low as possible, until such time as the next external review. Council, questions, comments, concerns? Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Mayor Gordon. I just have one question of clarification. It's um, point two, that the bylaw be indexed annually, um, which leads me to believe that it would be increased, but 4.1 in the general provision of the bylaw itself says permit fees may be increased annually by the tax rate increase. Is that insinuating that we, if there's no tax rate increase, it won't be, or it just may be? But I thought it would be, not maybe. Who wants that one? Sri, you gonna take a crack at it? Yeah. That's if we go for like a 0% tax increase, Councillor, is that what you mean, for potentially? Which would be lovely, almost impossible, but we could do it if we sucked reserves dry. Our Madam CFO would throw herself off the roof, but hypothetically yeah. speaking, good question. So it should be uh, based on the tax rate, annual tax rate. That's what uh, it was been included by Mike. Much. Clarification, yeah. please. Um, so it, it will be increased. It might, may not be. I, I just find it. Wrong word. For those watching at home, sorry, the mic was malfunctioning. So that hypothetical situation where if we could ever get to 0% tax increase in a year, that would mean that there would be no increase um, based on this bylaw on the building permit fees. So you're right. That would be awesome. <laughs> but unlikely. But still awesome. Any other questions, Council? Council Meredith. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Gor Gordon. Um, through you to um, Siri or any, is it Siri, sorry? Siri, sorry. Um, Siri. Yeah, Siri. Uh, Siri. Um, so it, it states in here the, um, um, this will be reviewed at the next external review of of um, the bylaw. So when when it, or when would that external review be uh, in the Is it every four years? Is it every three years? Is it every two years? Through your chair. Uh, it would be every five years. Thank you. So if we have a, um, um, the increase by the annual tax rate, so judging the last two years, we've been at 4%. So in five years, the building fees will go up uh, 20%. So I'm not, I'm not in favor of, of the tax rates going up annually. Uh, automatically with uh, um, with the reports I've, I've read, um, you know, um, with the uh, management asset plan and so forth, and the numbers I'm seeing, um, that 20% will probably be, um, most likely above, it'll be above 20%. I'd rather see this come to council every year um, and uh, and voted accordingly uh, on the, on the, with the fee schedule. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, I'll call the question. Oh, oh sorry, Deputy Mayor. I was just gonna, oops, sorry. I just wanted to clarify with Councillor Meredith's question that he's not in favor, are you, are you suggesting that we amend it before we call the question? We, we could amend it or um, I'm not in favor of this. I'm in favor of a yearly review. So if if everybody votes 
I'm not in favor of this, so I'm not voting for this. I'd rather see it come every year to, in front of council. Um, I'm not sure if um, a lot of developers or have, have read the report or they get these uh, agendas. Have they even seen it? Because Mayor Gordon said, you know, he, he usually gets phone calls, but he has it on, on, on at, at this on, on this um, fee schedule or fee increases. Uh, and it, to take this out of council's hand for the next five years, um, and we have two years left on ours. That that's another three on somebody else's plate. So I don't feel comfortable. Uh, on on making that decision, I'd rather see it come to council every year. Councilor McDonald, I'm wondering if it could be included in the budget deliberation that we increase the permit fees at that time instead of coming in that format. Okay, so we have one more sort of live budget left in our term, right? Uh, and next council, if they wanted, I, I'm CFO wants to chime in, but if ne next council decides that, you know, we're a bunch of, you know, nincompoops for having done this, next council can easily change this, right? We're not we're not necessarily binding the next council and next council could redo this bylaw if they wanted at their will. Heck, we could if we wanted, but this is really impacting one more budget cycle for us. And then it kicks into the next budget cycle with the new council uh, for 2026 and you know, if, if that's a bridge too far for them, they could always make this change. But this is just trying to paint some certainty uh, for people because the cost of living increase, which is what our target is for budget increases, uh, affects everyone equally. So it wouldn't really, it wouldn't seem too egregious to the developers that the cost of living increases that impacts their materials and wages and everything else, that this fee that the town charges also floats with that cost of living. So we could... Um, talk about amending it right now or you know we can live with it for basically one budget cycle uh next next council could decide that this is uh not good or make wholesale changes to it if they wished madam cfo thank you your worship uh just i believe we would need council's two-thirds majority to change the previous motion that was passed last july so the last july council did pass a motion that the building per permit fee bylaw be indexed annually by the annual budget increase until such time as the next external review and so tonight's public meeting was really a housekeeping of of that motion because it didn't get into the bylaw so um certainly council has the ability to to change that if if i believe we would but we would need the two-thirds majority to do so um secondly the um the report that our consultant brought forward last year um did did recommend an annual indexing um their their indexing was a three percent um, you know, budget increases can end up in that in that range as well. Um, staff took it that step further and said, in in order to basically maintain the service level we have today, it would make more sense for us to increase by that annual tax rate. It's similar to um, our user fees because uh, building services is a, a user funded service where we don't want to push tax um, we don't want to push costs onto the tax rate right which is why we recommend the same increase so if all of our costs go up by that four percent it would make sense to uh, to also raise the development fees by the same thank you does that help with some background so we've already actually approved this so we would need to um, get three quarters of us to agree to revisit it effectively rescind it because this public meeting it's right it's just part of that process that we previously agreed to thank you for that and through you mayor gordon and uh, i do uh <clears throat> understand this was uh approved uh, in a um in a previous meeting um i don't know if uh um, some of us missed what we were actually approving in indexing this um, um, by the annual tax rate. Um, I, I still think that um, although uh, we have one budget cycle left, um, if, if it's the same faces on council, then we understand that we can come back and, uh, and make changes. 
if it's a, a new council that comes on board, um, such as, you know, uh, there's a few of us up here on, on board and I, I'm one of them, um, it, it takes a little bit to get to know um, everything. There's, there's, there's a lot. So this can possibly go, um, you know, go through the next uh, council or it, it could be picked up on uh, right, at, right, at, right at the, uh, you know, the first uh, year of, of the, the new council. Um, I'm not going to roll my dice on that, so I would rather see it uh, um, come uh, before us every year, um, and and maybe give me an, an instance, uh, uh, a number, uh, put this in perspective. So if I was going to build a, a 2,000 square foot home in today's market, right? What are my fees before I even put a shovel in the ground? And then we can kind of get a a, a realistic kind of picture of how much that increase will go up every year. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh -huh. Or give me an example of, of a build you just did and what development charges they they, uh, they just paid in today. Uh, today. Through you, Mayor, uh, Councillor Murdis. Uh, I I'm not exactly sure with the numbers, but I think it should be the development charges would be around uh, uh, forty-nine to fifty thousand uh, for a single-family dwelling, and uh, if it's a new lot, yeah, that would be that. And the uh, building fees are around like eleven dollars per square meters to sixteen dollars per square meter uh, for a new single-family dwelling. Yeah. So th thank you for that. So. If we if we if we multiply that by uh, you know four to six percent a year uh, for tax increases uh, in five years, um, what, what would that be, um, Madam CFO? You'd you have your calculator out at fifty thousand. So you're so over uh, a twenty percent increase. So over the five years, and also note that last year would have counted as your as your one. Uh, that would be a ten thousand dollar increase on a fifty thousand dollar permit. Great, thank you. So, so that's a new build on a new lot. Before you put a shovel in the ground, you're you're sixty thousand uh, right now. So I I, I think. Um, as I said, maybe we'll put it on the floor. Uh, if we get two thirds vote, um, then we can. Uh... Oh, Madam CFO. Sorry, one more uh, consideration that was also part of that June report last year is our reserve balance, right, for building services, which does fund that service, right? So in years when permit values are down, uh, much like 2023, that reserve keeps that department afloat, right? And so at the end of 2023, the estimated balance in that reserve was just over 192,000. In the 2024 budget, we estimated to take 155,000. So as we stand at the end of this year, we're, we're expecting less than $40,000 left in that reserve. And so it can't sustain another short year. Right, so doing nothing now puts us in a in a bad position. Do you want to, if you put a motion to reconsider on the floor, um, there, there isn't any debating on this. We just have to see if there's three quarters of us that are willing to revisit this motion that we've already approved last year. Thank you, Mayor Gordon. Um, I just want to talk about reserves for a sec. Um, so you mentioned reserves, and 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 down in a later report, there's there, there's. Uh... Sorry, Councillor Meredith, we're oh. technically in a public meeting. We're really just supposed to receive public comment, and and then we can make comments or clarifying questions. This thing we're talking about right now has already been passed. This is just procedurally we have to do this for the. For the planning act have this public meeting and then we we rubber stamp because we've already approved this if the intention is to revisit this entire thing again 
we need to finish this process and then start a reconsideration, which could potentially trigger yet another public meeting later down the road if it's depending what the what the outcome is. We can't really mix the two together in this one. This is supposed to be a public meeting and, and clarifying questions and stuff. Do you, you understand where I'm going with this? We're not redebating that we can't redebate the original thing right now. It needs to be reconsideration has to pass first, then we bring up the whole the old report we already approved. Okay, let's just put a motion to reconsider them on the table. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you uh, kindly furnish us with said motion to reconsider? So no problem, stand by. Question, if I may, Mr. Mayor, is again to 4.1. It says it may be increased by the tax rate it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be. For, it, that, that's what our motion says. It'll be indexed annually, but the bylaw says it may be. So we might decide during tax that we want, only want it to increase 2% because it doesn't say it will be. That's my point. Staff are just looking into that to see whether that's sort of a typo or contextual error or if the, the spirit is that it will. Um, I can comment on that, I think. Uh, so, yes, I would I would say the spirit of it is that it will increase. And so if Councillor McDonald um, is suggesting a wording change, I think we could we could certainly make that. That was certainly the intent, the intent that it would go up by the tax rate. And again, the example that was previously mentioned about zero percent, then you know, that language I think would apply, but um, the will is is that it's it's being approved now, not not annually with the budget process. Okay, so hypothetically that may can work itself into the motion and that gives, that kind of unbinds um, council, like if every budget cycle, even though in the policy says it, it can increase up to and including the rate, we could change that, Madam Clerk. Is that? Thank you, Your Worship. The motion to reconsider is on the floor, so there is a there shouldn't be any discussion. I'm just trying to get. It's a year ago, so I'm just trying to get the information in the motion, so we shouldn't be discussing anything else. All right, fair at enough. the time, we'll just sit quietly here and wait for that to happen. So we dig through the archives. Uh, we left off with a motion on the floor about building permit fee increases. Uh, and the contentious issue seems to be the indexing annually with annual budget increases. Therefore, I now have a motion uh, that we need to suspend the rules of procedure in order to allow for reconsideration of item C 6.2 CSR back in 2023-39, building permit fee update, public meeting dated June 14th, 2023. I don't know if I just said 2029 or not. I got too many numbers rattling out, but it was from June 14th, 2023, of the June 14, 2023 regular meeting of council and more specifically recommendation number two, that the building fee permit bylaw be indexed annually by the annual budget increase until such a time as the next external review, which we now know is every five years. So I need a mover for that. I believe that's Councillor Meredith. And I need a seconder to get on the floor. <laughs> Councillor East, sorry, he's having a little brain cramp there. Uh, this, we need to have uh, how many votes, Madam Clerk? Six? Motion isn't debatable, and we need six. Right. So there's no uh, conversation. We know exactly what it is we're being asked to do, which is to revisit. Uh, so we call in the question. Uh, all those in favor, hands up. One, two, three, four. So it's defeated. Okay, doke. So we're back to the original motion that was on the floor, and I will reread it again, just for clarity here. Moved by Deputy Mayor Pro, seconded by Councillor McDonald, that the staff report CSR 2024-67 building permit fee increase dated July 10th today, 2024, be received, and that Council adopts the building firm permit fee bylaw as attached to the report, and that the building permit fee bylaw be indexed annually by the annual budget increase until such a time as the next external review, five years from now. We can continue on with uh, discussion on this, or we can call the question. 
Council's preference. I think we have been sort of debating the merits of it. Councilor East. Thank you, through your worship. Um, was this the motion that we were going to change the wording that for Catherine was speaking on for clarification? Is I believe sorry, I believe the motion was good. It was in the bylaw that Councillor McDonald was speaking to. So the bylaw currently says may, even though that may have may have been unintentional, unintended. Uh, it states may now. So if we do not edit or change anything, it is not prescriptive and it allows us some some liberty, even though that wasn't the original spirit of the bylaw. Is that an accurate depiction, Madam CEO? Through your worship, it, it actually um, would be, a, so when you're approving this, the bylaw should match. So we would actually have to change the wording in the bylaw to match what is in the recommendation. Okay, so we're kind of painted in the corner because we're not making any changes because the revisit just got defeated. So it is what it is. Vote for it or vote, vote against it. Clarification, please. The existing bylaw that we're just adding, number two in it that we agreed to, does it say may or will? If I looked it up. So through your worship, I think what's on the, the floor is the vote on this, and then the bylaws are further down in this section. So you may wish to, to, to wait. We'll look actually as we speak, but when we get to the bylaw section, we can have that discussion. Yes, yeah, so that's later in the meeting where the bylaws get presented. Uh, the building fee bylaw is 8.1. So if you wanted to uh, click on that link, 8.1, and just see whether the language says may, it sounds like if it does say may, that's unintentional and staff will be editing that to say shall because that's what we passed and approved last year in a nutshell. Madam Clerk. Not to extend this conversation any further, um, but when we get to the bylaw section, we can always say as amended, and we know that it's council's direction to change that wording, and we will change the wording. Great. Or if it's already says may, we just don't change it and we'll let her pass, we'll let her rip, right? Mm -hmm. And that might solve uh, a lot of things, uh, improve, also uh, allowing Councillor Meredith's concerns to be addressed every year in budget. So I haven't actually clicked to see whether it says may or not. I'm taking your word for it, but we'll get we'll get to that in eight point one, and we'll see. Madam Clerk, thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to for Council to keep in mind that if you pass this motion, it says that it will. So to pass a the bylaw that says may is it's redundant. It has to match the recommendation. So there will be a change in the bylaw. There may, there will be a change, not maybe a change. Such a simple little word. Okay, very good. So if bottom line council, you're voting for this, it will be, there's no may. It's If it says may now, it'll be fixed because uh, it wasn't intended to say may. And we're going to, it's going to be indexed at the rate of um, our budget increases, which throws the gauntlet down to this council to be as frugal as possible and keep our increases at or below the rate of inflation, which I don't think anybody can complain about paying uh, increases at the rate of inflation because that's what everything costs everybody. So that's our, our our primary objective in our budget increases. So I think this is one more incentive to hit it. What do you think, Councillor Meredith? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I put in a motion for 2.5%. So we're going to be below the rate of inflation. So it should be great. So, um, but I would like a recorded vote. Thank you. Super. All right, Madam Clerk, recorded vote when you're ready. Unless there's any other Weighing in, we think we beat this one to death. Okay, very good. Thank you, Your Worship. Council, you've heard the question. When I call your name, please say yes or no. Deputy Mayor Prost. 
No. Councillor East? No. Councillor Ball? No. Councillor Bald? Yes. Councillor McDonald? Yes. Councillor Patel? Yes. Councillor Meredith? No. And Mayor Gordon? Yes. The motion's tied, therefore it's defeated. All right, so the procedural fallout for having this uh, void right now, um, we don't have to deal with that right now. That can be done at the next regular council meeting in September because we have to do something for our building fee increases and uh, what to do with our reserves, et cetera. So again, not, it's not on the floor now. This one's dead. And uh, I thank the public for their input, even though we had none. Uh, hopefully they enjoyed our commentary. And we'll, this is going to come back like the boomerang, uh, either in September or at our uh, budget deliberations for sure, because we're going to have to talk about this for next year. As we mentioned, City Council is adjourned for the summer. So this topic of the building permit increase will be rediscussed in the fall. So all you Machif citizens living in Penetanguishene have time to digest this issue and bring any concerns to Council come the fall. While council was all together in the same room, they decided to invite the County of Simcoe to come visit them and talk to them about community and social services. As we know, homelessness and community safety is a concern Simcoe County wide. As the summer temperatures continue to rise, that means there will be more people out on the street suffering from heat exhaustion and heat-related illnesses. Penetanguishen Council was more than happy to hear what the county is doing to help their citizens through this crisis. Uh, next, we have presentation 6.1, which don't usually happen at special meetings, but uh, given the, the nature of this presentation and the fact that summer is upon us now, uh, it would seem timely, and I appreciate the fact that the county could attend to speak to us today. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Mina, Mina Fayez Baguette, the GM Socials of Social and Community Services, Wendy Hembroff, Director of Community Services, Homelessness specifically, and Andrea uh, Hirsu. Program Director or Program Supervisor of Community Services from the County of Simcoe and representatives from One Community Solutions, who it's awesome to finally meet you guys. I've, I've alluded a couple of times, you guys are like Pokeroo and the older folks will recognize this, is that I, I know you're around, I've heard you've been around, I've just never seen you and I just keep missing you. So I'm very, very happy that you're able to come to our council meeting tonight. Uh, so I welcome you, uh, Whoever's going to do the addressing to approach the uh, podium and press the mic button and drop some truth and wisdom on us and be prepared for questions. Uh, good afternoon, Council, and thank you for having us uh, through you, the Mayor. I will uh, mean if I was back a General Manager for Social and Community Services, uh, and I will hand over the mic to our Director of Community Services and the Homelessness Sector, Wendy Hember and she'll take uh, the presentation then and introduce our guests. Thank you. Thanks, Mina. I always have to lower the mic. So uh, thank you very much, Mayor and Council, for uh, for including us, including us in this evening's uh, agenda. Uh, we are very pleased, and I will if I could, uh, Your Worship, just introduce um, Kamala Shabizavadia is uh, here to my left, is our uh, Manager of Community Services, homelessness who has recently joined the county as well so very pleased that uh, Kamalesh is here as well. Um, following our, our provincial funding announcement in uh, April of 2023 uh, where the province uh, significantly increased the funding to homelessness prevention services and supports the county uh, worked diligently to develop a 10-point homelessness prevention strategy and uh, and used recommendations from a comprehensive uh, homelessness system review that was completed in 2022. The uh, 10 point homelessness prevention strategy included a commitment 
to enhance and mobilize services to improve safety and well being for all. A community safety program was introduced specifically for downtown business areas countywide. And uh, the community safety program was first launched as a pilot program in the city of Barrie uh, in May of 2023 in order for uh, the county and, and its partners to review the efficacy of the program and make determinations as to future uh, potential opportunities for expansion. So the program had set out initially to achieve two outcomes. One is to connect vulnerable individuals to services offered within the homelessness prevention uh, and, and support system. And two is to improve overall safety and well-being by strengthening re relationships with vulnerable individuals, business owners, and the community as a whole. So we often are asked the question, what, what is the difference between street outreach teams and, and our community safety uh, team partners? So to, uh, to define that, traditionally, street outreach teams work with unsheltered individuals, including those currently residing in encampments, and often use uh, outreach vans to, to access those areas to facilitate access to resources and services, including emergency shelters. The very first uh, defined point uh, of on the housing continuum is emergency homeless shelter for individuals that are that are living unhoused. Community safety teams enhance this work through engagement with vulnerable individuals who are located within walkable downtown business areas. And uh, through a comprehensive uh, request for proposal process, One Community Solutions was the selected vendor for community safety services. Community safety teams have expanded into the city of Aurelia. They are beginning their work in the town of Midland. And, uh, and next we are uh, working with the town of Collingwood to expand into that area as well. And accompanying us today is Paul Lunen, is behind me here, uh, one of the founders of One Community Solutions. Uh, Paul's teams are on foot patrol in, in downtown areas, including downtown Midland, as, uh, as the mayor has referenced, uh, to connect those vulnerable individuals experiencing homelessness and with resources and, and services. That will include making referrals to shelters, outreach teams, mental health services, food security programs, a range of supports that are unique to each individual that, that the teams may encounter. One of the other services that is offered uh, and completed by One Community Solutions is the collection of discarded uh, drug paraphernalia. So that has been a very welcome addition uh, to the communities in which the programs have rolled out. Um, our county team through Kamalesh uh, and Andrea had initial engagement with the Midland BIA and we'll be reaching out to key stakeholders, including the BIA, municipal bylaw, um, police services, as well as uh, the guest house shelter, Waypoint, who is actually the funded youth outreach provider for this area, as well as the Salvation Army Midland, which provides the adult outreach services in, in the Midland area. And though the purpose of that meeting, that upcoming meeting, will be to A, help our community safety teams further understand the needs of our local business owners in, in downtown Midland, help to better understand the needs of the community as a whole in the downtown area, certainly learn from the experience of shelter uh, as well as outreach, what the uh, hotspot areas are. And Paul, I will not uh, take from, from Paul's opportunity to answer some questions, hopefully, as we move forward. Um, but One Community Solution has completed an assessment of, of the Midland area prior to beginning their work. So they are familiar with geographically where individuals may be encamped, or the kind of hot times in the in the downtown area. Um, and now at this point in time, we'll be engaging with that broader table to make sure that we can leverage partnerships and, and that folks feel uh, comfortable with the information they have as business owners 
to pick up the phone and, and call one community solution to perhaps address a situation happening. You know, I know there's situations such as you arrived here, your place of business and an individual may be sleeping on the doorstep, right? And it's not about necessarily uh, a, a lack of safety as much as what do I do with this individual, right? How do I, how do I refer this individual? How do I not, you know, escalate the situation? And Paul and his team certainly can, uh, can provide some assistance in those areas. So I don't want to take up too much time because I appreciate these are often, uh, you know, areas of great interest for, for council and community members. So I will uh, leave things there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just before we get uh, to hear from uh, One Community Solutions, a quick question. I'm a little foggy on the difference between a community safety team and outreach because the community safety team's role vis-a-vis -vis outreach's role. I, I sat today with Angela at uh, at Salvation Army, which I've never, funny enough, I've never done before. I actually sat there and had a good chat, just trying to, to make sure that we're not overlapping um, you know, a little overlap is good for safety's sake, but complete overlap, of course, isn't good. And I know the county is, you know, not big on duplication of services. So I was just trying to understand and rationalize what the community safety team is going to do that outreach can't. And will the community safety team supplement uh, rather than replace some of the, act well, the activities that are basically one or just very tiny team at uh at the Salvation Army is currently doing for us. So maybe maybe you could start with just letting us know what the county's scope scoping was for one community solution and what the intention is for the two to work, um, you know, in tandem. Sure, thanks for the question, Your Worship. Um, one community solutions um, a works for my, and I don't want to speak for Paul's so wave. If I could beg of you for a moment, if I could include Paul in this response because he can speak most knowledgeably and and you know specifically to the work of the community safety teams from the county's lens, it really is about embedding that additional layer of support in the downtown core so that our outreach teams, our funded outreach teams can do the much needed work in encamped areas with individuals who are not necessarily at this point willing to come into shelter or interested to come into shelter. And the outreach teams offer a more complex a more comprehensive level of service in terms of they're connected to the shelter system, they're connected to our various services and supports. They're not, their main role is not maintaining a safe environment, whereas our community safety teams do that safety piece. And I call them safety teams with a social conscience. So they're not a law enforcement agency, but they certainly provide an added level of de-escalation and safety services but from a very socially conscious and compassionate lens. And I'll turn things to Paul if I could. But you'll need this higher. <laughs> Good day. Thanks for having me here, guys. Um, I mean, she actually put it very well that um, the work that we do, the scope of the work that we do, is to address things from a safety perspective. Uh, we not only serve the unhoused, the street involved individuals in this area, as well as others, um, we are also here to uh, create a safety presence on behalf of the community at large, right? And so, um, you know, we're sort of, we started out as this sort of alternative to security, but wanting to treat people in this space or occup that occupy these spaces with compassion and wanting to build relationship and create engagement so that we might better be able to deescalate conflict. Um, whereas outreach is more strict it's strictly in service of the unhoused community and i don't think it necessarily addresses let's say community safety concerns although some of the work that we do does run parallel to um uh, our services we definitely occupy different spaces in, in the uh, sense that we are here to address safety concerns specifically and we do that by showing compassion and building relationship super and then just quickly, I'm, I already know the answer to this question, sure. uh, but I'm asking for the benefit of everybody else. How often are can we expect uh, OCS to be in our community? Sure. Uh, and, you know, sort of what cadence is it? So we're going to be here once a week uh, from the hours of 3.30 to 9.30, um, which are outside the hours of any other outreach teams that I'm aware of anyway. Um, and uh, the days are not uh, specific right now. Right now we're sort of building a baseline to try to determine 
when not just where the hotspots are hotspots are and the highest levels of activity are so like you know we'll be doing all uh, alternative days on ter alternative weeks we expect to find things are busier over the weekend as you might expect to see but you know we don't have a baseline for this area just yet so we're building that right now so thanks just in follow up then if through your baselining activities mm -hmm. over the next course of the next couple of months, because we kind of swell and need in the summertime, right. uh, would it be reasonable that, and maybe this is more a question for the county, yeah. is there additional funding and do you have the capacity to spend more than a day a week in Midland uh, if, the, if the need justifies I, that? I would let them answer that. So we have the capacity to offer the service. The decisions lie with them at the end of the day. Um, so I won't tell them how they're spending their... <laughs> yeah, and and that's fair. And are you feeding information into Hyphus, which of course is the is the primary collection methodology for, you know, for making these determinations on funding and around need? Uh, well, we feed our information directly to the county of Simcoe, and the decisions are made there. Um, we have received some training around Hyphus, and I I understand that there is a, more steps to go. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the intention is certainly to have our guys on the street. A, have the ability to be able to input information into IFIS. Yeah. Sure. Oh, no, absolutely. And thank you for the question again, Your Worship. Most certainly that, as Paul has referenced, right, our opportunity as we embark on this expansion that just started in April is to really assess the needs of the community as the as the program is, ro is rolling out. Um, and the one piece, if I may, that I Thing to say earlier that I think would be really helpful to really clarify the difference between outreach and community safety and in addition to what Paul has provided is our outreach teams very specifically focus on housing outcomes, connecting people to housing, shelter, getting them on that continuum. And certainly Paul's teams would connect people with outreach if they're not connected. But that is the main criteria that would define the difference between the two. Thanks. That's good to know. I'm sure there's Lots of questions from council around this. Uh, so I do, again, I, I'm really glad that uh, you're able to come here and introduce the service to us. Uh, and just for, for those following along, this is something that was born out of the community safety symposium that we hosted last October um, as an identified gap and a need. And it's something that worked really well in Barrie as a pilot. And uh, being the squeaky wheel in uh, in county as I am, along with the deputy mayor, um, and obvious demonstrable need that you can see through the HIFAS data, uh, with Midland being number three in the Simcoe County for homelessness on the by name list, uh, clearly, clearly qualified us for extra supports. And so we have been lavish with extra funding, which has helped the shelter to be open, um, you know, 24 seven and have day programming again and have the bathrooms open and empower Simcoe's back in line again. Like there's a lot of things that are, that have come out of um, the data that's being collected and the community's input at the symposium, which spoiler alert, we're planning for version 2.0. I think it's going to be November, but um, anyway, so we'll have a good chance by then to debrief and see how One Community Solutions impact has uh, been felt by the community and what their takeaways are too. So I'm going to shut up now because I can talk about this all day and yield to my uh, peers. Who wants to go first? Councillor Ball. Oh, sorry, I saw the finger. Deputy Mayor and then maybe Councillor Ball. I don't have any questions at this time, um, but I want to say thank you. That symposium that we had last year, um, great things came out of it. And I'm I'm getting reports that you're seen on the street, and I think people are going to start to feel a lot safer. They have somewhere to call. They have someone to to go to, even if they feel that they're not comfortable downtown, and they see someone, they can approach that person. I just I think we're on the right track, and I'm very very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of someone to call, well, we're waiting for Councillor Ball. <laughs> Where do we get the number that we can refer people to call? And what happens if they need to call and it's not the one day a week we have OCS? Does it get redispatched to outreach or does it go to just a voicemail and they get talked to them next week? That doesn't really help if there's a guy passed out in front of the bank today and you're not on duty till three days from now kind of thing. So if I may, I'd like to kind of share a response here uh, in that, um, yes, we've brought along flyers, which we will certainly distribute. We can follow up um, by sending an electronic version of that as well. So everyone has that at their, uh, at their disposal. Um, in terms of the direct call to One Community Solution, 
the uh, the flyer will outline it. So it's actually a great little diagram that will indicate, you know, where is it appropriate to contact one community solution? Where is it more outreach focused? Where is it a police matter, for example? Um, there is no wrong or right answer. You have to do what you need to do in the moment when you're having experience. But that is a little guideline that uh, certainly will help direct those calls. If there is something that is happening in on those out of the regular day or week uh, hours, Andrea Hurasup, who is the program supervisor that's overseeing the uh, community safety team portfolio, it's as simple and easy as a reach out to the county, and we can we can certainly help make some of those connections. And it is never a wrong answer to contact outreach services either. They are very responsive and very available, and and can certainly you know within their scope provide some assistance as well. Awesome. And for council, I brought uh, An Angela's card with me with her cell phone number so we can refer. And we're going on that little walk next Monday anyway, dispensing this information to our downtown merchants. So we'll just add this to the goodie bag. Councillor Ball. Sorry, I have the uh, silly mic today. Uh, I've heard some positive things about One Community Solutions being in, around town. So I thank you uh, for being there, for uh, positively interacting. And so there was a lot of uh, comments made by residents saying that you you were interacting in a great way, that the uh, homeless population was really receptive to you. So that's really positive to hear. I agree with Deputy Mayor Prost, we're in the right direction. Uh, hopefully we continue to go along. Uh, I have a little bit of a question though. Uh, I did see that the provincial government has committed funds uh, this week towards uh, programming that they previously are forcing closures now around our area, especially. Uh, we could potentially have vulnerable populations unhoused coming into the streets of Midland. Is the county prepared for that? And are you prepared to increase more rapidly than you had originally planned in Midland? Uh, through the chair, thank you for the question, Councillor Ball. Um, yeah, the, the county is constantly trying to um, just review through a data informed strategy on how to consistently invest in different areas as a system as a whole. So uh, there are many communities that have been impacted by some of the decisions made in the last few days. Um, what we what we're trying to do concurrent to that response is broker better provincial services across the county, including health care services. So you're closing in on a few outcomes that we'll share when they're ready to be like uh, for formalized, but that will create some more assistance in uh, addressing the needs of clients who are long-term users of our systems and maybe putting them in better uh, services that are more appropriate for their needs, therefore opening up more space, as well as um, we're gonna be going to county council uh, um, later this year, I, they're off, they're in a break set they're in session their sessions in break right now but uh through that process we're going to also uh be trying to be able to invest into reserves in order so that we can have short and long-term responses so while we're trying to broker long-term permanent kind of funding uh pockets within uh different orders of government both federal and provincial we're also trying to uh manage our current approved fi finances in a way that allows us to put them into reserves and then reinvest them appropriately when needed. That being said, um, just a few days into those decisions, so we'll have to see the impact. I mean, we've been watching carefully in terms of our data points on homelessness in general and kind of the trends it's going in. I think um, I think there's definitely a lot more to be done for sure. Um, but I also, you know, we've been investing significantly in things like deep subsidies and we accomplished 162 outcomes on there. So there's a lot of preventative work being being done and we have invested significantly in, in housing retention and eviction prevention programming and homelessness prevention programming. So we that was part of our 10 point strategy. So um, those investments are still there and available. And actually right now we're, we're watching the utilization of it and there hasn't been really a spike uh, yet, but we know that there will be and that's why we've invested a bit more significantly in those pockets of funding uh, in 2024. 
Thank you. Uh, I figured you were obviously aware of what was happening, but I'm glad to hear you are well ahead of it. Uh, I appreciate your team as always coming in here and updating us and uh, honestly appreciate how flexible you are and how innovative. So thank you for, so much. Council Meredith. Thank you, uh, Mayor Gordon, through you to, um, um, well, just a general question, comment, first of all. Um, we had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, not only myself, but uh, Mayor Gordon and Deputy Mayor Prost, along with the BIA uh, manager, Katerina. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting uh, Kamalesh and, uh, and Andrea uh, to, and, uh, and uh, voicing our concerns. And um, I, I think, um, you know, and, and bringing those concerns from the community uh to the forefront and um and i'm glad to see that uh, you know they're they were hurt uh they, we the residences the business owners are are, are being he heard loud and clear uh on on our uh on the issues that we're facing and um it was a great meeting uh i don't want to get into everything that we because we can talk <laughs> about this for a while um my one question um, that I do have is uh, on the the one day a week. I would um, so the timeline on that for uh, once you receive um, the data uh, coming back. Uh, what type of time frame? And I'm not sure if that was answered in our meeting or not. But what type of type of time frame are we waiting for to to collect that data and see if there's increased presence on uh, the streets rather than uh, more than one day a week? Thank you. Thank you, and through your worship, um, and I think I will just defer back to uh, your worship's comments with respect to the upcoming sneak peek for the uh, version two of Forum, which November-ish, uh, we'll have about three solid months under our belts in terms of community safety teams by that point in time. That really reflects where we were for the very first pilot that we uh operated back in 2023 so it'll be a good opportunity to take a look at the data from that three-month period have a conversation around where the community is is finding the experience around the downtown core at that point engage in a bit of a consultation again to say what are those experiences looking like and again we would involve outreach you know BIA members of council in that conversation to make sure that that we've got it right and then from there look at making a decision around does it need an increase is it a matter of adjusting the hours what what does that look like at that point I would suggest about a three-month period would be about right perfect thank you thank you Councilor Bertel thank you mayor through you mayor so I just want to thank you guys for coming and creating these different pathways for the support. And I think we're going to be moving in positive direction. Uh, and I guess in November, we'll find out how these outreach programs are progressing. So thank you for coming. Thank you. I got another one here. So the this document, is there a PDF version, a digital version that we can get and then share through our channels and publish online and what we can probably actually tack it right on, you know, by editing the PDF to our existing community safety uh, toolkit that we're handing out. So then these people downloading it will have access to that. And then for those watching at home, yes, we're talking about one day a week for now until the data drives um, more presence with One Community Solutions. But you know, it's not like that means there's nothing else happening yet or six days of a week. All seven days, including that one day of overlap, we've got an amazing resource in our Salvation Army outreach uh, whose boots on the ground, knows the people by name, by face. They check in with her. She checks in with them. She visits the encampment. She knows where the tents are hiding. She also uh, knows people who are housed who just hang out and sometimes put up a tent and she'll kick them out of there and send them home. When you go home, you're making it you know, worse on the folks that have no home to go to. And so we had a really good, brutal, honest conversation today. And uh, I've invited Angela from uh, the Street Outreach team. She's basically the team of one, but she does have a small team of support folks, including some volunteers from the shelter that you know, aren't laying past it in front of the bank all day. They're actually at the Outreach Center at Salvation Army helping to stock shelves at a food bank and 
and working and learning and trying to better themselves. So it's easy to paint people all with the same brush and it's so unfair to do so. So uh, she's going to come and talk to us in our September meeting and introduce her services to council for those who are unaware of the work that happens there and also St. Vincent de Paul is a food bank running in town. So there's just a lot of tandem support. So I don't want people to think, oh, there's only one day a week with OCS. We have lots of other supports. We're blessed or cursed, depending on what side of the coin you're on with all these amazing services in the county has, you know, lavished us with even more uh, funding and supports and piloting some of these new things. So there's a lot of activity that's happening. I think the BIA sees it now where they didn't really feel that love before. And we have a good bridge between council and BIA and Councillor Emeritus. And, uh, you know, I think things are moving in the right direction. So I, I'm looking forward to getting, know, getting to know the OCS team and introducing them to the public and hopefully you're talking to anyone you walk by on the streets, just letting them know what you're all about, what you're doing. And we'll encourage people to uh, say hi to you too, buy you a coffee and and uh, cheer you on as you're helping um, some of the most vulnerable in our community. So big thanks from my end. That sounds like council's united on this. And any other questions, council? I'm rambling on again, like I do. No? Councillor McDonald, come on, you're good for something. Thank you, Mayor Gordon. Um, actually, my question was addressed, my concern with just one day a week. And, um, but what also comes to mind, and it was probably discussed with the BIA meeting and yourselves earlier, but um, a new person has just um, changed ownership of the grocery store. It's now a no frills and they've, I've witnessed um, unpleasant things happening there personally. So they've really worked hard at making it a safer place. But the owner um, expressed to me that the seniors are saying they don't feel safe using their back entrance, like from the parking lot across. So is that something that One Community Solutions would um, prioritize? And then I'll read it and do my homework. And I'm sure I can contact you if I have more questions. But thank you, and I look forward to working together. Councillor East. Sorry, we, there was a question in there. Please go ahead, and then we got Councillor East yeah. up. <laughs> thank you, Your Worship. Um, certainly, that's, a, that's something, especially at the origins, right, of our, our new partnerships with our community safety teams in each community, having that opportunity to connect in with business owners that are expressing concerns such as that are, are really key opportunities for for our community safety teams to connect in. So that's certainly something, and Paul, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but that I would certainly encourage you to reach out directly to uh, Paul and his team uh, for that kind of support with uh, with the new owner of No Girls. The other piece, if I may add, is with respect to our outreach teams, and I was remiss in not mentioning this earlier, is we, uh, we do have a relationship with the Georgian Bay uh, Native Women's Association, who also operate an Indigenous outreach team in Midland. And um, and so that is another partner that uh, we certainly will make sure the contact information is shared as well. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, not sure if I'm strong enough to do this, but... Um, I reflect the same concern about the one day. I really would encourage the County of Simcoe to look at the challenges Midland faces. With us having the super jail, the mental health center, Chigmick, the guest house shelter, we have created the perfect storm on our streets. I'm not feeling very well, so I'm gonna to try to pace my words Everybody in this world deserves shelter. And I would really open the County of Simcoe's eyes to opening to see that really at the end of the day, we can't help anybody if we don't create affordable housing to get them in homes. Now we as a council work together to offer land to open up so that we could hopefully move forward with housing. 
But until those houses are built, we have the perfect storm here in Midland that's being overlooked. Now, I understand that every other community in Canada is facing the same challenges. But we have a unique challenge. The simple fact is that we have people that get out of jail. They don't move back to their original communities. We have mental health issues on the streets. We have people that are genuinely homeless that need help. But the pe there are some people that are benefiting from this perfect storm that we've created. Drug dealers, keeping these poor people sick. So the truth is, is that, and I'm directing this to the county of Simcoe, that we need to build affordable housing to help these folks. And then I really believe that if we can work together to believe, build these homes, that we can get these people back on their feet and give them optimism, possibly deter them from a road of drugs, substance abuse. With a home, a roof over your head, you have more opportunity to fight for your life. So I'm really trying to get these words out, and I'm really hoping that this falls on the county of Simcoe's ears that we want a partnership up with you to build houses. We got to get this moving, but until that, we really have to look at more than one day a week because Midland, particularly, has a unique situation. Your Worship, if I may, and I, I am going to turn the uh, mic over to our General Manager, Mina, to speak with respect to the affordable housing uh, component. I do just want to say thank you, if I may, for your depth of compassion and concern for for individuals in your community and and I sense beyond so I just wanted to express my appreciation to you for that um very compassionate um the con statement that you that you've made so thank you and I will turn things to Mina I I share that sentiment um uh... Councillor East, uh, thank you for your statements and and the courage to to share that. I, I do want to make it very clear that the county is absolutely aware of the need here in Midland, and um, and we're committed to to offering as much support as we can. I do want to just you know talk a little bit about the expectation of what we can do and how we're going to do it. Um, justice systems, you mentioned justice systems, healthcare systems, and police systems, in part of that are contributing factors uh, to the conditions that are uniquely you know, found here at, at the town of um, Midland. And, and I would say that we're continuously engaging on discharge planning out of justice and we're trying to land um, pre-discharge planning uh, where we have our staff teams and funded agencies working directly in that system so that discharge can be diverted where possible uh, from just release without a plan. Um, and that goes, um, that that's something we're we're closing in on, and some of the the comments I shared earlier that we'll be able to share a bit more of how that will work. We're working closely with Waypoint on mental health and addiction services in general, and trying to find more space for supportive housing. So I agree that the we should be developing as much as we can, but we can't develop our way out of this uh, as a solution. It takes too long to develop. So we've been looking at things like modular facilities. Um, acquisition of land or properties that we can quickly convert but our purpose right now is to focus on creating supportive services that are funded provincially or federally on site with the affordability um, because if we're talking about people in recovery or people being diverted from homelessness or ending their homeless uh, this uh, experience of homelessness they need the higher acuity folks that are taking longer to house are the ones that are in need of the on-site supports and care and sometimes or more often than not forever, like permanent support and care that they may not be able to live independently. So our 10 point plan and our master plan that we just got passed at County Council talked to us, how do we get a path to creating more units and developing is one pillar of that plan. The other pillars are subsidizing rent, creating more rent subsidies, so creating affordability in where things exist, and then utilizing our own community housing stock. So one huge policy shift we made is that we are 
we introduced a, a local priority off our centralized wait list for people experiencing homelessness that are on our by name list to access 10% of the units that we are creating and developing directly. So this means that they don't wait in a chronological order waiting for the deepest subsidy we offer, which is community housing, but can actually rise to the top of those lists uh, for certain units where they have to participate in a supported program. So all of these like policy shifts and investments we're making are comprehensively trying to address the issue from many different areas. But we're not alone. Like uh, it takes the cooperation and support of both provincial uh, systems that fund, you know, justice systems or healthcare systems to be able to invest in municipal services because this is beyond our mandate. And and while it is beyond our mandate, it, it is the reality that we face. So we take it on. But legislatively, we have no authority to create health services or or enforce justice. So community safety and well-being um, approaches like One Community Solutions will help address issues on the ground, but they're not necessarily equipped to do things like enforce uh, or, or tell someone where to go or how to go. They can refer them and encourage them and do it through a, a, a dignified and um, compassionate way by building a relationship with that person to hopefully encourage them. But other than having a space for them to go and a service for them to use, that's where we're trying to broker those services. So believe me when I tell you, we know, we, we recognize and hear you. Uh, and we are you know, putting our best foot forward and our best efforts to try to create a comprehensive service uh, support services here at the county. So. I just wanted to thank you for uh, acknowledging that we're in the perfect storm in Mithen. It needs to be said. Thank you. All right. Well, so to a large degree, we're in symptom management since we can't, we don't have the jurisdiction funding or authority to deal with root causes. And uh, so we're in the symptom management game and we're throwing more band-aids at the, you know, at the wound and dealing with wound care and all the things that go along with that, you know, from a, I think of using medical uh, analogies, that's kind of the best we can do right now until somebody somewhere <laughs> comes up with the solution to, you know, pathological homelessness stemming from mental health, addiction, lack of education, growing up in abject poverty, abusive, you know, multi-generational abusive homes. And some, everyone has their own unique combination of those things. It's rarely just one. So those are all way bigger than a little municipal lower tier government or even an upper tier like Simcoe County is going to solve. But in the meantime, we got our, good eggs that run the place that uh, aggregate good intel from all around the country and around North America, people trying to find solutions and we learn from their mistakes. You look at small communities like Pembroke, you know, in, in, uh, in the Ottawa Valley, Eganville, places like that, those communities are absolutely lost in addiction and homelessness. And you'd never think you'd ever see that in those little communities. Midland, I'm telling you, we're blessed by comparison. Look at Belleville, just lost. Timmins, lost. You go to the bigger places like Sudbury, absolutely just, you know, underwater when it comes to this. So as much as, you know, we have a problem with the six tents and, you know, four guys laying around downtown, we are living the dream in comparison to many of our small urban neighbors around Canada. I'm not suggesting or trivializing that. I'm just saying that, you know, we should count ourselves lucky that we're getting all these supports right now and we're trying to deal with it before it gets completely horrible rather than some of these communities that wake up after not having done enough or anything and they're lost. It's just, it's heartbreaking. So the part that, the, you know, the, the, all the heavy lifting happens at the county and the squeaking happens here and the solutioning happens in partnership with the community council and the county. And I think we're check, checking all those boxes. So this is just another, another tool in the toolbox or another, uh, you know, medical appliance in the paramedic bag. And we'll throw everything we have at the, the issues in, in Midland as, for as long as we can. So, I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor. I just want to point out that um, there's a lot more positive going on than a lot of people might realize. This is, is huge. Um, but we also have Shelter Now, Car Talk House, and the, the new Weber House. There are a lot of really good things happening. And I know it doesn't, like, there, there might be little things for people, but maybe people don't even realize. And all these things are growing as they can and what's reasonable and feasible. And I just want the public to know that, that a lot of good things are happening and it takes time, but I'm very, very happy that they're happening. 
Well, right on. I look forward to uh, seeing some of your smiling faces at our sim uh, symposium version 2.0. Uh, it's going to be an, another open house style thing where the community can come and tell us, hey, is any of the stuff that's been uh, done in, you know, since last October, has any of that made a difference? Do you feel like it's moving the needle at all? And I expect from some people's lenses it won't have, but other people will recognize it and will aggregate all of that input that night uh, with our panel. And um, that can set the direction for the next year of activity. And then we can see what information and metrics the county's gathered through HIFAS and, and uh, OCS's engagement. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And it's not an overnight fix, but again, we're, we're managing the symptoms in a new way. So I appreciate that. Thanks for coming up tonight to our special meeting and sharing all this with council and the folks that follow online. It's really important for them to hear that we're not just sitting around wringing our fists going, Ugh, what do we do? So thanks, everyone. As the city of Penetanguishing works with the county to solve this housing crisis, you are going to be hearing a lot more conversations around multiple city councils in Simcoe County and their discussions around development. At the top of the show, we mentioned building permit fee increases that were brought up at this council meeting. Another topic that was brought up at this same council meeting was development charges. City Council sat through a presentation on this topic by Watson and Associates. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. So I, I've been asked to, to come and give a, a brief presentation on the development charge background study that uh, our firm Watson and Associates is undertaking on behalf of the town. Uh, so on the next slide, in terms of the items I want to cover today, just to go over a brief introduction of what development charges are, why the town is updating the bylaws at the time, go over at a high level the methodology that we're required to follow under the Development Charges Act uh, to give the council an, uh, an understanding of the process that we'll be following. We'll briefly talk about the current development charge bylaw and policies that govern the implementation of the charge under the Act. Uh, and then just some next steps on what counts can expect in terms of the process to finalize the background study and bring the new bylaw forward to count. So on the next slide then, from a, a high level over what development charges are, as I think you'd be aware, there are a tool available to municipalities under Development Charges Act to recover growth-related capital costs of new development, so only related to capital uh, cost and not the operating implications of new development. Uh, when looking at what types of needs can be included in development charge background studies, these are the broader growth-related needs that are in addition to the local development requirements related to a plan of subdivision, for example, to the new terminal sidewalk and water and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, and so with respect to the, the current bylaw, one of the drivers for updating the charge at this, or the bylaw back on at this time, is that the town's current bylaw will expire in late November of this year. In the next slide, then, um, a couple other items on why um, background has been undertaken now is to addition to the primary driver to have a charge, a uh, new bylaw in place prior to the expiry of the current bylaw, but also be to reflect some of the notable change in legislation that have occurred since your last bylaw was passed in uh, November of 20, um, or 2019, sorry. And so, uh, you know, I need to be aware that there are quite a few changes to the legislation. Uh, and so they're listed here in terms of just those that have occurred since 2019. Uh, the most notable one would have been Bill 23, the More Home Build Faster Act, that uh, significantly restricted municipalities' abilities to recover growth related costs from new development. Uh, some of those restrictions have been rolled back through Bill 185, which is the oil ascent in June of this year. Then, as well, we'll also be addressing changes in anticipated capital needs and development uh, in terms of the process that we're going through with them. On the next slide, then, just to, to give you a, a high level overview of the methodology that we will be following. So, the, the methodology uh, or the process really commences with looking at what is the amount, type, and location of development in the town, and that being governed by the town's uh, official plan and the county's growth management strategy. And then the, the Development Charges Act 
stipulates what uh, services can be included within a development charge background study, and as well making sure that when we look at what is the demand for those services in response to new developments, that those uh, needs are not greater than the average level of service that was imposed historically, so that colleagues are not increasing service levels and requiring new development to pay for that. So as capital cost and projects are identified to provide that increased need for service, there's a deduction that the act requires uh, to make, such as recognizing if any of those projects are also a benefit to the existing community, whether there's any grant subsidies or other contributions that would be available towards those projects and anticipated to receive those costs need to be deducted so that you're not double recovering of those costs. And then the growth-related uh, net about the charge growth living costs are a portion to uh, the anticipated development to calculate the charge on a residential per unit basis. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, sorry we just lost power here. We're just kind of rebooting I, and we're having difficulty oh. hearing you. And I think it's because you're on speaker. Is, is there a way to keep that. yourself off speaker? But there is one moment. Oh. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're not we're not actually even looking at you at the moment because we lost um we lost power. It's been flickering on and off all day. Can you hear me better now? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, so I'll, can I? Can you see the presentation? Or you just want me to proceed? No, nope, we not are sure good. Your power. Back live. Okay. Okay, so um, then I'm, I've had to switch to my, my phone, so I can't see the, so if you go ahead to slide five, um, just to highlight the, the current bylaw and the schedule of charges. So the, your current development charges are imposed by dwelling unit type, whether that be low, medium, or high density, and then per square meter of non-residential development. The majority of the uh, services that are included in your bylaw are um, imposed across the, the municipality, and and majority of those services continue to be eligible under the Act. So when we look at the, the areas that were included in your current bylaw that will be continuing to be examined, those include general government, so the growth-related studies that are required to uh, inform the future capital needs, library fire protection, police, all continue to be eligible services that we'll be examining. Uh, indoor recreation and parks fall with un under the, the definition of parks and recreation services under the Act. Uh, public works and roads and related services will fall under the, the definition in the Act of services related to a highway and continue to be examined. As noted by the asterisks here, parking was removed as an eligible service uh, in 2020, and so the, that service can no longer be considered. But then transit will continue to be considered as well. And all of those services that I've identified so far will be looked at on a, a municipal-wide basis uh, with considerations for whether any of these services should also be examined on an area-specific basis. But then, uh, um, of course, the water and wastewater services that are required for new development will continue to be examined uh, only in the urban service areas that, that, that they apply. And then the, the other aspects related to the area-specific development charges um, based on council's prior and pension that will continue to be uh, examined through this process will be the area-specific charges for the TIF and by the Bay Area with respect to uh, some of the roads projects that were in need that were identified uh, for that development, and then the water and wastewater infrastructure for the Balm Beach uh, area. Then on slide six, just to talk about some of the policies that govern the implementation of the bylaw and that will be reviewed with staff to make sure that the uh, the definition, the policies within the bylaw are continue to um, operate sufficiently. From a, a timing of collection standpoint, the charges will continue to be calculated and collected at building permit issuance. Uh, with respect to the ability to uh, exempt charges, uh, the town cannot waive or, or exempt charges unless they're um, unless those exemptions are defined in the bylaw or statutorily required but you can enter into agreements with uh, develop developers and applicants to allow for those charges to be paid before or after they otherwise would be payable 
Uh, there are a couple other distinctions to that in the Act in that rental housing and institutional development must pay their charges in six equal annual installment payments. And then you can also charge um, interest on the on those uh, installment payments, as well as for the charges that are calculated early in the earlier in the approvals process at site plan and zoning bylaw uh, amendment application. Uh, on slide seven, then, to just highlight what are the statutory um, or what are the abilities for municipalities to exempt charges, and then uh, what what those statutory exemptions are. So, uh, as I mentioned, the Act does provide for certain exemptions that you must follow. Uh, however, municipalities can in the bylaw define other types of exemptions that they do want to include. And generally when municipalities have those types of exemptions, they're based on the type of use. So for example, place of worship or farm buildings, uh, geographic area, the type of development, or even the, the type of service that they may want to exempt from development charges. What's important in noting though, is that any exemptions to the payment of development charges do reflect a loss in revenue that cannot be passed on to other types of development through development charges and do, does represent a, a financing impact to the town that would need to be uh, financed through uh, taxes or rates. Uh, and, and as I think you're well aware, that was part of one of the reasons why the when through Bill 23, when the province brought in the mandatory phasing of development charge bylaws, but that was re re reflecting a fairly significant financial impact to municipalities. Um, but as a, a good news story for municipalities, the province did remove that requirement to phase in bylaws uh, through Bill 185. Then on slide number eight, uh, in terms of what the specific statutory exemptions are that you must witness, if you don't charge yourselves uh, upper tier governments as the county or school boards, land that's intended for use by universities exempt, uh, any industrial, any expansions to existing industrial buildings by up to 50% of their existing size are exempt from payment. You can add up to two additional residential units within an existing or new single detached, semi-detached or row house. And those additional units would be exempt with only one of those units uh, being able to be in an ancillary structure. As well on slide number nine, uh, nonprofit housing is exempt. That was added through Bill 23 late in 2022. Uh, inclusionary zoning affordable housing units are also exempt. And then uh, affordable housing units as defined in the act are also now exempt with the province releasing their bulletin defining the income-based and uh, market affordable unit uh, thresholds for each municipality. Uh, and so that uh, information is included in the presentation. We can um, happy to go over that if there are questions, um, but I'll, I'll leave that detail there um, for now. There are also additional exemptions for attainable units that aren't yet in effect uh, until the province is defined, uh, comes up with a definition for attainable units. And then there are reductions for rental housing development depending on the number of bedrooms in the rental housing unit. So a 15% discount for uh, less than two bedroom units, 20% discount for two bedrooms and for larger units, a 25% discount. So slide 10, in terms of the uh, non-statutory exemptions, so again, these are the exemptions that council has chosen to define in the bylaw over and above what is statutorily required. Those include churchyards, cemeteries, and burial grounds that are exempt under the Assessment Act, as well as uh, public hospitals. And then the last, one of the last policies just to highlight is what your bylaw also includes, which uh, most bylaws um, do, is redevelopment credits to reflect that where you have an existing building or structure that is demolished and replaced or converted to another use, the replacement of that existing structure doesn't represent an increase in demand for service. And so development charges are not payable in those circumstances. So where you have someone who demolishes a single family home and rebuilds it with a new one, that does not reflect a, a demand for new service. So again, in that case, charges would not be payable. And then on slide 11, uh, just in terms of how the charge would be augmented annually, the Act does allow for the charges to be indexed in accordance with the non-residential building construction price index. And the 
and the rationale that allowing for these charges to be indexed annually is to provide for that charge to increase uh, in alignment with the underlying increases in capital costs that those funds are meant to pay for. Uh, and so that can be on a discretionary or mandatory basis. The current policy within your bylaw is for that to occur on a mandatory basis on January 1st of each year. And so then lastly on slide 12, uh, in terms of the, the next steps in the study process, so we've kicked off the process with uh, town staff um, last week, uh, and then we will be proceeding through having uh, detailed discussions on the anticipated development, uh, the historical level of service, and the capital needs that are required to continue to provide service for new uh, development, proceeding to review of those draft findings and policies with staff later in August with the intent to have the background study released publicly uh, by September 1st, uh, then to proceed into the statutory consultation process as required under the Act, which would be to uh, have a public meeting of council, and that would be pro provisionally scheduled for your September 25th council meeting, um, and then the bylaw would be brought forward for consideration for passage at your November 6th meeting, which is required to be at least 60 days after the release of the study, which is slated for September 1st then the bylaw would um, come into effect either at the time of passage or prior to the expiry of the current bylaw uh, later in November. So that does conclude what um, I had prepared for the, uh, the introductory presentation, but if there are any um, questions or comments, I'd be uh, happy to try and assist. Thank you very much. I can kick off a couple here. Um... I think the one thing, and actually it's it's unfortunate your presentation came now rather than earlier in the meeting because it, it might have helped inform some of our conversations around the building permit. And the, the concept of growth paying for growth is, a, is salient here, especially around development charges. So the fact that, uh, you know, anytime we take one for the team and, and don't ascribe costs where they're incurred, meaning people that use a service or whatever pay for that just means everybody else pays. So, you know, what we're choosing to do by, you know, and we've chosen to uh, not increase um, the uh, development charges by an indexed amount means that we're passing on the costs of that department and all the services it provides to the broader taxpayer. So the person that has the dough to build a new house, we're given a break to. And that's now being subsidized by the people who can barely afford to keep their existing houses and have to pay our taxes. So that's awful big of us, but that's what we just decided to do. So now we're being effectively presented with the same presentation, only this time it's development charges. And the recommendation is to index them at some standard rate. And, you know, typically that would be the CPI. So, you know, I'm just wondering if when this comes back to us in the fall, if council would think about what we did today and when we're asked to index the DCs to think carefully about where we're placing the burden. The, the province has fed or downloaded onto us a whole bunch of new el eligible things where DCs are forgiven thanks to the province. They've never yet fulfilled their promise of making us whole for these losses that we're incurring. I have yet to receive an email from the minister telling me where to send the bills. So and we've already had one app, one application that qualifies. That's the Métis development. No development charges there. It's affordable housing. So, and there may be more in to coming. So what happens when we don't collect from the people who are building these homes and selling them for a profit? Everybody else in the town of Midland pays. And that sucks. That is an inequity that we are putting in on ourselves. So we are forcing everyone else to pay so that someone who's the beneficiary of a product or service can get a break. And we've decided to embrace non-resident fees to try and fix that inequity. We've decided that free parking in the town of Midland right now is not a long-term sustainable thing because everyone's paying for that otherwise and all the costs involved with it. So I just find us at a bit of a crossroads here where you know I can understand the sentiment of not wanting to um, attach these increases uh, to fees that are the beneficiaries of these are individuals who either buy a new home or erect a new home, or in this case, developers who are going to make 
lots of money off of their developments and look at development charges and building permits as the cost of doing business. If we save this developer, let's call it just 8,000 bucks, do you think they're going to drop the price of their resale on that house by $8,000? No, that's going to be kept as profit. They're going to sell at whatever the market allows them to sell at. So I, I think one of the takeaways, and I really wish your, the presentation had happened earlier, is that growth has to pay for growth. The beneficiaries of a service need to pay for that service. And if they don't, everybody else in our community does. And that's the decision that we made for development or for uh, building permits right now. But now we're effectively being pitched by the authority on this for development charges saying that's what we should be doing for development charges. So I find it'll be really interesting when this does come to council in September with the recommendation, whether we have a change of heart in growth paying for growth, or if we want to stick with the let's you know give a break to the beneficiary of a product or service and just strap on the cost to everyone else who's not benefiting from that product or service so you can see the list of things that development charges pay for and you know what the uh, building permits pay for that's all growth growth related activities so the timing of this is great i just wish we'd had this presentation earlier i don't know if it would have changed the outcome of the conversation but you know it sh if you look at slide eight we can go back to sl slide eight. Sorry to make you do this. The last paragraph on slide eight. Oh, sorry, slide seven then. So the last point, in effect, it is a loss of revenue to the municipality, which will have to be funded via taxes, rates, reserves, and other financial resources. So if the people building who are going to sell what they build or keep what they build, they live in it and build their own thing, don't pay. All we're saying is, well, everyone else is going to have to. We'll cut them a deal and everyone else will have to pay to carry their water for them. That's not a position that I'm prepared to take ever for a municipality. So you guys know where my vote is and where it will be in September. I'm telling you right now, if you look at slide 11, I think I got that one right. Uh, yeah, there talks about indexing the charge annually in accordance with the prescribed index, which is typically the CPI. So indexing can occur on a discretionary, discretionary and mandatory basis. I'm okay with discretionary because you know, if we had another plague or pandemic or whatever, we can obviously times change, we gotta be able to change with them. But we should set out something predictable, barring the, you know, the unpredictable, that allows some cost certainty for us to budget around. And for developers who, it takes many years from designing a subdivision, for example, to actually putting shovels in the ground to actually selling the units. And, and these things come due at different times. So we, uh, I, again, I just wish we'd had this presentation first because it might have helped inform council, unless I'm completely off and you know people think I'm nuts in, in my summary on this, but growth is supposed to pay for growth, not the rest of the taxpayers in the room. And um, that's just my position on it. And I, I just wanted to put that into the conversation. It's, it's not really a question. It's more of a, a, a statement when we see this come back to us in September. All right, so I've, as hoped, I've spurred a, a, a flurry of hands. So uh, we'll start with Councillor Patel. Thank you, Mayor. So when I was reading the reports, I guess, last few days, I thought the same thing, that this should have been presented first before we went to the DC charge report, uh, because the discounts, the rental housing is going to get, and if we don't do the CPI for the DC charges, then the rental housing developers are going to get a greater discount. So we should tie the DC charges to inflation. Madam CFO, just clarity. Sorry, through your worship to Councillor Patel. Uh, just I do need to note that Sean Michael does have to leave in two minutes as well. Um, he is pressed for time tonight. Uh, we can continue and, and staff can try to answer any questions that council has. Um, but just on that, so the, the, the first part of tonight's the public meeting was on building fees. And as much as they are definitely tied to development and the growth pays for growth mindset, they really are two different things. 
um, this study is just kicking off. And so tonight was really just to give council a, a brief overview of the process that we're going to be undertaking under the next couple of months. Um, but yes, certainly the, the indexing is, is an important part of, of previous bylaws and that annual um, inflation that, that does help um, when costs do change. Uh, for example, in 2023, I think the construction price index went up like 17.6% or something like that. So like it, it was massive, right? And if we didn't have the ability to raise the, the fees, you know, our costs are going up but the fees that we're collecting are not, right? So we do need to make sure that they they are aligned. Um, and again, unfortunate, uh, Sean Michael was only available tonight at, at this time frame. But, um, and again, the, the building fees is is really a separate discussion and one that council, uh, and actually Sean Michael was the one to do the study, um, one that council, a decision that council had already made or or staff had thought that council had made. So really that's, that's why the timing didn't quite line up, but. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, who's next? Councilor Reed? Not really a question, just more of a clarification. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure what we voted on earlier was so that we can control those rates every year. So I don't think that we're kiboshing it. My understanding of what we just shot down was the ability to control that. So although I appreciate what you're saying, I think what we're doing is we're putting it in our hands to control those rates. A am I understanding that correctly? Okay, thank you. Is that an accurate, like, because we kind of left this, we didn't really know what happened as a result of that. Where are we at with rates and increases right now with based on what happened tonight? So based on my understanding of what happened tonight, we would still be at current rates, right? So there would be no indexing for 2024 at this point in time. Um, and, and you're right, council does have the ability to, to, to set the rate. Council has the ability to set the tax rate, right? And so that bylaw was, was really aligning the rate increase with the tax increase that council set. But yes, as my understanding is as of as of right now, the decision is there's there's no increase for 2024. So through, I will agree through your worship, um, CFO is accurate. There is no increase, so we are at 20 at the same rates right now until it comes back in September, and in September um, you will require two thirds majority to bring it back on the table to to have those discussions. Council Meredith? Just to comment on what we were just commenting on. So in 2024, up to this point, before this meeting, we were at 20, we were at the rates of, of 2023. So nothing has changed. We haven't lost anything. We haven't gained anything. Right? So anything new coming forward from now until budget cycle is at 2023 rates. At budget cycle, staff comes to to, to council with a 4% increase, or maybe it's 5%, or maybe it's 2.5, whatever the tax rate was, and then we can approve it. Is that correct? So we haven't really lost anything. So we're giving us the choice whether agreeing with staff, you know, the, the current rate, we could follow the tax increase, or we can say, hey, Maybe that's too high. Maybe it's a percent less. So that's what I'm getting at because we could be coming in at 6% or 7% in 2025. Do we want to increase a, a building or do we want to, you know, a defer building from, from builders saying, or, or even homeowners that have a prop, piece of property will want to build, but it's going to cost them $70,000 before they, they, they stick a shovel in the ground. So that to me is, 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 is not putting any tax uh, burden on the on the on the on the people uh, paying taxes we're not we're not giving developers a free ride we have the choice instead of it being 5 years uh, the next 5 years indexed at at the um, uh, the tax rate which could be who knows what what it could be um, but and it also gives the opportunity for the next council to make those decisions so 
I don't know what you're lecturing us on here up here about, but that's the way I understand it. And when it comes to DCs coming up, we could have the same conversation. And if we want to do the same thing, we can, or we could go with the, the CPI. So I, I don't understand why that, that, that rampage had to a, had a, had a go on here um, because we're not doing anything differently. We haven't lost any money up in 2023 because of the bylaw that probably should have been done a while ago that this public meeting should have been, you know, it's coming up to us now, but what have we lost? We haven't lost anything. Thank you. Sorry, just if I may. So we did we did raise the rates effective July 15th, 2023, right? So it's been exactly a year. So it, it, it would be due now to raise them again. And so as of right now, we remain at 2023 rates. We, we can certainly go through the budget process and raise the rates, but that would be for 2025 which would essentially mean that we've missed a year. So, and it, but you, ha you haven't missed a year because up to this point, we didn't approve it. So we haven't lost anything from, from July. So that you're talking in the next six months that you, you've lost because whatever fees you've, you've, you've uh, come before you today, prior to today, they would have paid 2023 rates, not 2024. So you're not order. losing a year. Are, are we talking development charges or are we talking um, the previous topic, the previous agenda item? I thought what we were talking. Uh, yeah, this is development just a development charge. charge. You're, you're right. So the concept and the rationale for my conversation was that what's being recommended in the, in the presentation is that we tie the increases to an indexed amount yearly. And... So that is the same question. We'll be asked the same question in September. So my cautionary note there was that, A, whatever we don't collect from users about whether it's a development charge or a, you know, using the arena or whether it's a, um, the uh, building permit, the town has costs that happen regardless. And those are either borne by the fees that we provide to the people who benefit from those, or those costs are soaked up by taxpayer in general. That's my point. So whether we've lost anything right now is immaterial. It's we've set ourselves up for loss because if we do not collect from the people who benefit from a service that the town provides, whether it's infrastructure or people to go and do inspections, everyone else pays for that. And that is my point and the source of the lecture. And that's why I wish we'd had this conversation, unfortunately, before, but, you know, staff to their point, thought this was a done deal. It was more just housekeeping. We're getting doing that, getting the public meeting out of the way and we approved the bylaw, but we're not. So my point of that lecture is and remains that whatever we don't collect from the people who consume a, fee, a service is not free money. It's not like it didn't happen. It means everyone else who pays taxes in Midland is soaking up the costs unless we can eliminate that service entirely, which we can't, of course. So that when this comes back to us in September, we are going to have the same conversation about you know, wanting to say, incur or save development charges and maybe hold them back, maybe not tie them to a, a per, you know prescriptive increase. So we're going to get that conversation again. So it's just going to feel like rinse and repeat boomerang conversation. So that is the point of this. And that, so I just wish we'd had this one earlier because it would have helped feed into the conversation about something that staff had all believed that we'd already approved. So that's my point. It's done. I'm not suggesting we re revisit it again this meeting, but it's exactly the same point. These are services that are consumed by a few, paid for by the many, unless the people that consume it pay for it. So that's the point. Yeah. And and I get your point, but it's still, unless unless we, we uh, the next tax uh, in 2025 when we come to budget, and, and if the the building permit fees come to us and they want a 4% increase and we say no, that's when the taxpayer loses, is it not? We have the control and that's all I'm saying. And this was in, in the agenda that what, what was just read to us. Um, so by, by stating that having this before um, the decision was made, if, if you read the agenda, it was here, this is, I, I, I get it, I, I read it. So at the end of the day, we had the information um, 
So would it have made a difference on the vote? I don't know. But I don't agree with five years of uh, indexing. And, and I still won't agree with the D DC charges. Come to us every year and request the, the increase. And therefore, we can make a sound decision. But, but to, to, to let it go on for five years, who's it benefiting? Like, really, one, one year it'll be 6%, and the next year it'll be 3%. So I don't understand that the highs and lows, but we're, we're not in a, putting the town in a, in a terrible position here. We have the control every, every year to assess it and approve the fees, whether it's this council or the next council. And that's the only point I'm making. I don't like to have it in stone for the next five years. So, and I'm, that is basically it. So I don't know what we're losing here, but we, I, don't, I don't believe we're losing anything other than the next six months of 2020, uh, stuck in 2023 uh, rates, right? I'm glad it came back up, and I'm I'm glad this was a, a a topic of discussion. And the DCs, when they come up, it'll be probably a, a mirror of of uh, the building permit fees. So, and if if people change their mind, once we fill the seat as well, um, so be it. I'm I'm happy either way. But I'm 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 fighting for not only the taxpayer, but I want I want growth in our community, and I don't want to uh you know. Uh, people stymied by a seventy thousand dollar ticket before they put a, a a fee before they put a shovel in the ground, and that's my point. Thank you. Alrighty, well that's good. We kind of I know we've walked, we we blurred the line and went back to the last one, but it, they did tie together, and I I wove them together. So it's a good thing we've had this conversation. I think it's good the community's heard it, and hopefully they understand this a little more about how some of these uh, intangibles that cost the town regardless need to be funded one way or the other. And last but not least, since city council is going to be adjourned through the summer months, we wanted to leave you with the city of Penetanguishene's assessment management plan. This asset management plan, there's a whole lot to consume in this one. And this came in right in the, under the wire because we have to have this done and submitted. And it's a, it was a beast. So, I have a motion here moved by Councillor Ball, seconded by Councillor East. Staff report CSR 2024-70-2024 Asset Management Plan dated July 10th, 2024 be received. And one, the Council accepts this report for information. And two, the Council adopts the Asset Management Plan in accordance with Ontario Regulation uh, 588-17, Asset Management Planning for Municipal Infrastructure. This is probably one we don't just jump into questions on. Maybe we'll... We'll turn it over to staff because we have a presentation and which will likely spawn all kinds of questions. And if folks have been following along, our neighbors in North Simcoe, they've all, well, everyone in the province has been doing it, but North Simcoe has been doing this. And if you have a look at the results of their asset management plan and the things that have been declared, you know, near end of life, how much they got to fund, how bad the reserves are, and what hope there is to find infrastructure funding from the province to help out with some of these aging assets. Uh, if you've seen the well, you've seen the report, so you know you got a preview of what we're about to get presented. So I will turn the, this over to Madam CFO and be gentle on us. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, Council. Uh, so as the mayor indicated, tonight's presentation is is really just a high level overview of the recently completed asset management plan. Next slide, please. Tonight's presentation will touch on the following key sections of the AMP asset management plan. I'll use the word AMP just for everybody, just for short form, uh, including a brief introduction, the key statistics derived from the plan, an analysis of the overall asset portfolio contained within the AMP, the financing strategy developed to date, and the next steps as we continue to meet our regulatory requirements. Next slide, please. Why are we here? Well, in 2015, uh, Ontario Regulation 588-17 was made under the Infrastructure and Jobs Prosperity Act. And under this regulation, there were several milestones that municipalities um, have to meet, uh, with each milestone really progressively building upon each other, really with the goal that asset management is no longer uh, do it and sits on the shelf type exercise. It really needs to be integrated into daily practices. 
With this regulation, there have been a number of requirements along the way, including an asset management policy that outlines the process that is considered during our budgetary process, as well as commitments to consider uh, the impacts of climate change and EV discussion on EV charging stations would be one of those, um, as well as the associated costs and, and alignment with other regulations such as the Safe Drinking Water Act. In 2022, the asset management plan for all core infrastructures was created. This plan included the current service levels, as well as qualitative and quantitative metrics for all road, storm, water, and wastewater network access. The milestone for today, or for 2024, is the creation of an AMP for our non-core infrastructure assets, as well as general assets. For the town of Midland, this would include all of our municipal buildings, our vehicles, our equipment, land, and land improvement. Staff have met the requirements of the regulation by utilizing our new asset management software. And this software was purchased through grant funding back in 2021 and implemented throughout 2022. Next slide, please. This slide highlights the key takeaways from the plan including the overall replacement cost of the asset portfolio, which is 584 million. This equates to an average replacement cost of 77,000 per property in the town of Midland. This would assume that that property was both uh, tax paying as well as on water and wastewater services. The percentage of our asset, asset portfolio that is in fair or better, better condition is 69%. This is an important statistic as it tells us that we have some time to plan for replacement. The remaining statistics of annual capital infrastructure deficit and reinvestment rate are tied to our financing strategy, which will be discussed in more detail in the following slides. But here you can see that the annual capital funding deficit of 9.6 million or 1,335 per property that we're currently not meeting our investment needs or reinvestment needs. Next slide, please. This slide just breaks down that $584 million replacement cost. And as you can see, the majority of that cost is really related to that core infrastructure that was covered in our 2022 plan update. Building assets, both municipal building and community buildings would be the most significant value of the assets covered in this update. Next slide, please. This slide ties back to that key statistic slide showing the actual reinvestment rate, which is the current capital funding divided by our estimated replacement costs versus the target reinvestment rate, which is our annual requirement divided by our estimated replacement costs. As you can tell, some assets are approaching their annual requirement, which I should clarify, is basically taking the replacement cost of an asset and dividing it by its useful life. And so later on, I'll talk about a vehicle as an example, but if a vehicle replacement costs 80,000 and that vehicle is good for 10 years, 8,000 would be the amount that you would need to contribute annually in order to um, be putting away enough to, to purchase that asset in a 10 year time frame without it impacting your tax rate. I should also note that for the purpose of this analysis, the annual sustainability level levy that council approves uh, as part of the uh, budget process has been applied to the road network, which even with this application, you, there is still a significant funding gap. Next slide, please. This colorful slide shows the condition of the asset portfolio noting that the condition of some assets is age-based. At this time, I should note that the 2022 inventory was used for the development of this plan. So assets that have been replaced in 2023 or are planned to be replaced in 2024 would likely show in the very poor or poor categories. Again, overall, according to the plan, 69% of the town's assets are in fair or better condition. Next slide, please. This slide ties in the forecasted capital requirements as identified in the town's 10-year capital plan. 
In the 10 year plan, the town estimates our future needs to be approximately 204 million. Based on the total replacement costs included in this asset management plan, that would mean that about 35% of our asset replacements that are identified in this plan come due in the next 10 years. Next slide, please. This slide identifies that annual requirement mentioned above, which again is based on the total replacement cost divided by the useful life. So again, the vehicle example, recognizing that there is a shortfall between the annual requirement and the funding available. Next slide, please. This slide further breaks down the available funding and includes the annual deficit by asset category for the town's tax funded assets, assets which equals 8.7 million. Annual capital grants have been included as sustainable funding sources, along with the town's own reserve contributions. Next slide, please. An annual deficit of 8.7 million would equate to a 30% tax rate increase if this level of funding was to be achieved today. Next slide, please. This 30% tax rate increase could be achieved over a five, 10, 15, or 20 year period. Going back to the previous slide, which indicated that 69% of our assets are in fair or better condition, this again reminds us that we have some time to plan for the replacement. The plan recommends a 10 to 15 year strategy for our tax funded assets, which is consistent with the strategy outlined in our 10 year capital plan. So that's that two to 3% increase every year for capital. Next slide, please. The next three slides provide the financing strategy for our rate-based assets, being our water and wastewater network. In total, the annual deficit is 934,000. As you can see, a healthy portion of the annual rates revenue is available for capital. Next slide, please. This funding gap of 934,000 will still take some time to close as a rate change of 24% is required. Next slide, please. Much like our tax funded assets, this rate change can be spread over a five, 10, 15 or 20 year period. This plan recommends a five year strategy for rate based assets, which is consistent with the recommendations again in the 10 year plan. This is for a couple of reasons. One being the town has significant water and wastewater related expenditures required now which are include, included in the town's approved budget. Also, water and wastewater assets are considered core assets and therefore were not the focus of this plan update, meaning the replacement values included are still based on two, 20, 2022 tender results. As you may know, staff have seen considerable increases in pricing in this area and therefore expect to see higher replacement values when, when the plan is updated next year. Next slide, please. These last slides touch on the debt and reserve strategy. With approximately 20 million in current debt, the town has available debt capacity to ensure that our infrastructure replacement needs are met, despite the annual funding deficit noted previously. As the slide states, the amount of debt required will be dependent on the actual timing of replacements and the chosen chosen rate change model to achieve full funding. Next slide, please. And finally, the topic of reserves. As you know, reserves play a critical role in long-term financial planning. In short, reserves help to stabilize tax rates and manage debt. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes our reserve capacity based on our 2022 year-end values. These balances do not reflect current commitments in the approved budget. While the town does have some reserve capacity, it is limited when you compare current balances to commitments and the needs identified in our 10-year capital plan. 
which again reinforces the need to continue to increase our annual contributions in order to meet our future obligations. Next slide, please. The last slide reminds us that asset management is ongoing. And although that this document uses data from a point in time, asset management is part of staff's daily work. While this document is largely a desktop exercise, in practice, staff have been using very innovative solutions for asset management to help us identify replacement needs in real time. In 2025, addition, additional regulatory requirements will need to be met, including integrating proposed level of service to, for all asset categories. This will put further emphasis on the need to refine our service levels and our financing strategy. Thank you for your time this evening. Happy to answer any questions that council may have or take any questions or comments back to the asset team for further consideration. The motion before council is to accept the report for information and to adopt the AMP in accordance with the Ontario Regulation 588.17. Thank you. Thank you, council. I think that one slide that showed the, the requisite sort of baseline tax increase to fund that, depending how long you want to kick the can down the road, was very sobering. I saw numbers from six to two on that spectrum. Um, those are the questions we're going to have to, uh, you know, deliberate at every budget. We got one, well, two. Yeah, one left, in, no, two left in us. Two left in us, you know, to talk about this. And this is going to be that question that we talk about our reserves. You know, do we not fund them to try and defer pain and artificially keep increases lower? Or do we put money away for the inevitable rainy day that is no longer impossible? We can't just ignore it. It's here. We're filing with the province. They're going to know. Everyone knows. We can see what, you know, the household per household debt or percentage of that is. It's pretty staggering and sobering. Anyway. It's a receive for information. Any questions on the presentation? Council Meredith? Just a question and just for clarification on the, the key statistics. Um, the annual reinvestment rate is one, you say 1.3%. <clears throat> the target reinvestment rate is 3%, which um, it's on page seven of the slide. So I thought um, every, every time we come to budget time, we, we, we talk about the 3% that goes to the 10 year capital plan. Are we not putting 3% into the capital plan currently? Um, cause this was just done. This, this report was dated. Well, is it, was it dated for 2024? These, these numbers, like, is it, they're, they're current, correct? So have we been contributing 3% to the 10 year capital plan? Or is it, that's my, that was my understanding, or is it, 1.3%. Through your worship uh, to Councillor Meredith. So the last two budgets, we contributed 2.6 and 2.7% of the annual tax rate. Um, the target reinvestment rate is slightly different. So that's looking at what we're contributing as a numerator and your denominator is replacement costs. Right, so it's it, it's a bit of a different statistic than the two point six and two point seven percent that we're contributing as part of the annual budget. That that's two point six and two point seven percent of the annual tax rate. The two should not be the same. Okay, just to, to clarify on this. So 2.7%, so our, and then plus the actual reinvestment rate, 1.3. So with that, if we were talking about last year's budget, is that 4% that we contributed to? Or are you looking for a 3% and another 3% for 6%? Like, I, are they two, you said they're two different things or? Just not clear on it. So, sorry. Yes. So, so when I say we contributed two point seven percent 
I believe in this in this year's budget. So we contributed of our tax rate, we contributed 2.7%. The tax rate went up and we contributed 2.7% of that to reserves, right? That is different than when I'm talking about that target reinvestment rate, because that's looking at what is the replacement cost of the asset? What is the life of the asset? What do I need? So my vehicle example, right? When I said, if a vehicle costs 80,000 and it's good for 10 years, that means I need 8,000 a year. So when I'm giving you that number, that's, that's the aggregate of every single asset and taking into consideration the replacement cost, the useful life, and saying, this is how much money I need. Okay, thank you. So I, I just want a, a, a clear, so if let's say we're in budget cycle right now in 2025, right? And we're asking for two point, point let's say we mirror last year's 2.7% reserves, right? We, we have that, we approve that. What out of this asset management plan are you looking for? Another 3% on top of the 2.7? Or like, that's kind of, I need to look clarity on that. What the plan recommends is that we continue on the same path. So within that 2 to 3%, that's that target that says over 10, 15 years, if our replacement costs remain in today's dollars and nothing changes, we would be fully funded. That's what that says. So no, not asking for an additional two to three on top of what we're already doing. It's saying every year we need to increase by that two and a half, three percent just for reserves, just as we did the last two budget cycles. So if I may, just one more. So that's why I'm, I'm a little confused on the actual reinvestment rate of 1.3%. That's tabled on here. Where the target reinvestment rate is three, we we're, we we fell short at two point six and two point seven percent. So why is our actual reinvestment rate one point three percent? That's kind of because it's a different calculation. I I I think maybe you and I should maybe talk offline, and I can go over that. Thank you. No further questions. Yeah, we're almost stumbling into actuarial territory here because really that's what we're doing is projecting and of course that eighty thousand dollar asset right now when it comes time to replace in 10 years ain't going to be 80 grand so that's what they're trying to project in here and we put away the the dough other questions on this one all right well it'll feed nicely into uh, we can revisit this i'm sure we will get a little primer on it again at budget time uh you know as the justification for funding into these reserves and our asset management is a requisite and it's no longer optional. The province is saying thou shalt. So we're being, we have to declare what we've done and we also have to have a path forward to prove that we're putting the money away because what the province doesn't want are bankrupt uh, municipalities going, oh, we failed the plan, so you have to bail us out now. That's really what they're hedging against. They want to make sure we're being making good fiscal planning decisions around the useful life of our assets, whether it's rolling stock or to your point, land or buildings. So we'll talk about that in a few months when it's colder. All right. So council, we've got this on the floor. Uh, do you, are we good with the ask or do you want me to reread it? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? It's carried. Mercy for watching. We hope our Machif friends living in the Penetanguishene and Georgian Bay area were able to get a better sense of what city council is doing for you. Again, most of these topics that you've seen addressed by Penetanguishene City Council are being discussed all throughout Simcoe County. So if there's an issue happening in your area that you would like us to discuss, please let us know at program at gmail.com. Or you can leave a comment in the comment section of this video with things that you want to hear from us. Merci for watching, and we'll see you down the river. Mm -hmm.